looking over the, the list, some of the things that were included in there, you know, different bills that were kind of, you know, had lots of different things included. You mentioned the, the Clean Energy Act from last year, the Energy Bill of 2007. And including there were some other things like raising cafe standards for automobiles, which saves folks money on gas. I mean, what was the consideration when you guys picked out which bills you were going to uh, outline as? A good question. The bills that we support are in support of are bills that take a comprehensive approach, if you will, that support renewables, that support energy conservation, but don't pit fossil fuels versus renewables. Make a point that it's all included, it's all important, and the more supply, the, the a reality check, if you will, that for us to get to a future, a renewable future that I think many of us want to get to, there's gonna to have to be a bridge. And that bridge is good old fashioned fossil fuels. And so develop those fossil fuels, develop nuclear power, uh, to develop clean coal, use technologies to make it environmentally feasible and viable, but don't pit artificially so-called bad energies versus good energies. They're all good energies. And renewables are a part of that formula and a part of that mix. And conservation is a critical part of that mix as well. And those bills that had a comprehensive approach, like the Americans for American Energy Act, that had it all uh, wrapped up within one bill are the bills that we supported. Those that artificially pitted one energy versus other energies and favored one group versus another group was, uh, were not bills we supported. So bills that were only about efficiency or renewables were not included in the list? Well, they, they, they were not uh, high on our priority list. Uh, the highest on our priority list are bills and, and most representative by uh, the bill Americans for American Energy Act uh, that had a comprehensive uh, approach and that included it all. The, the, uh, uh, the Bush administration uh, EIA, the Energy Information Administration came out with a report earlier this year, which has gotten a lot of press. I'm sure you've heard about it. Said that offshore drilling um, will lower gas by two or three cents a gallon in 10 to 12 years. Do you think that report is wrong, or how did, does that factor into your support for well, drilling? Well, you know, I, I think there, there are many reports out there uh, that speculate on the impact that uh, offshore drilling is going to have uh, on. Uh, increasing energy supply, that is one of them that you reference. I would reference the fact that the executive order that the president uh, uh, removed, that was in place actually since his father was president, President H.W. Bush, uh, a, a ban essentially on the continental shelf drilling. The fact that when President Bush, this President Bush, removed that, that ban and that executive order, it had an, it was largely symbolic because there's also a congressional order. So the ban still stands until the Congress moves like the president did. But the fact that just merely a symbolic act of saying that Americans are going to get serious about developing their own energy resources, we saw an immediate impact on prices. We saw an immediate uh, drop in prices. So regardless of this report that you make reference to that talks about concrete energy supply, there is a, excuse the pun, an environmental, or and I think some have even said psychological impact on the market when um, moves are made uh, by elected officials, President and Congress, to say that America is finally going to get serious about developing its own energy resources. Uh, w one thing I didn't hear mentioned, and um, I'm curious how it plays into all this, is, is global warming, climate change. You know, this, the IPCC reports say that climate change is going to have a disproportionate impact on the poor globally and at home. Uh, does that factor into the, the bills you support or oppose? Well, or? We, we, we certainly do factor in being environmentally responsible. We are stewards of the earth as well. Uh, but we say that, you know, we don't get into the debate and there, first of all, we do recognize that there is a debate on the question of uh, global warming. But we're not, that's not our purpose, that's not our focus. Our focus is on the very concrete, and very real high prices of energy and, and what we consider to be foolish energy policy that leads to, uh, to these high prices. There's also a reality check in terms of the global warming question on what happens when you include in this formula uh, growing economies like China, growing economies like India, and the fact that their development of their economies, what impact that that has on so-called global warming. So when you consider these growing economies, and when you consider that the developing world, I mean, the great thing about the, uh, if I can 
break my arm patting uh, myself on the back. The great thing about the Congress of Racial Equality is that we are an American civil rights organization, but we have chapters all over the world, and including in Africa. And I can tell you from traveling to Africa and talking to our members uh, in the developing world that they want to develop too. They want access to affordable energy. They want access to electrical grids. They want access to not using uh, cow dung, if you will, mm -hmm. as energy resource and, and, and have the opportunities that are uh, uh, manifesting themselves in the West, but also increasingly manifesting itself in places like China and India. So what happens when these developing world economies also want to get into the same game that China and India are in? And what impact does this have on the question of global warming? And so when you consider all these things and all these various uh, factors and um, variables, then you have to balance that and the real prospect and impact that uh, prospective policies can have on global warming versus the very real concrete energy prices that a mother in Southeast Washington, D.C. or a farmer in Colorado has to pay right now today. Not speculation, not speculative, price, high prices today, right now, and, and, and unnecessarily high. Um, so right at the peak this summer when, when all these gas prices were topping four dollars and the uh, all the major oil companies put out reports that showed record profits. What you know, if we're talking about this issue as a, a poverty issue, what's what's the what's your stance there? Then how do we address the fact that the well, oil companies are bringing in that's, that's, record that's, profits? That's a, that's a good point. Um, I think that the more well, when you have a reduction of supply, then prices are going to increase. And the biggest beneficiaries are going to be those that are selling the, the, the item that is uh, in, in increased demand while there's less supply. So it would it seem to me that our effort to promote a greater supply of energy resources uh, is something that will directly impact prices and maybe even directly impact the profits or, or the lack thereof of these energy companies. In fact, we, you know, we're not taking a position uh, on the profits uh, or lack thereof of energy companies. That's not our business. They, they have their own boards of directors, their own uh, CEOs and CFOs that can handle that for themselves. What we do say, though, is this, that some of the big multinationals that are, are always, always considered bad guys uh, by the media, these multinationals make their profits not just on American energy. In fact, probably a minority of their profits are made on American energy. The majority of their profits tend to be made by developing energy in uh, countries that don't have uh, a stifling of supply. Countries in the Middle East, countries in Africa, countries in South America. Some of these countries, not particularly good countries and certainly not necessarily allies of the United States of America. So again, we say, that's why we say that their profits are their business. What we're talking about is developing American energy for Americans so that we can have a direct impact on these prices and access to affordable energy for Americans. What we say in terms of these uh, multinationals is they're going to make their profits one way or the other. Question is, at what price do the American consumer, does the American consumer have to pay? Okay, uh, one, one final question. Um, there's a bill um, or, or bills have been proposed that would uh, tax some of the oil company profits and send them directly as, re as, as rebates to lower income people, which would seem to be uh, a boon, at least in the short term, to lower income people. Would you support it? Do you support a bill like that? We don't. Um, we, look, first of all, we are in favor of certain subsidies that assist poor people uh, with energy prices in, in, in general. LIHEAP, I think, is one of the more successful uh, programs. But we don't, but that again, we see as a very short term solution that poor people will have to depend on the goodwill of public officials to bring to fruition and to keep uh, in place. What we say is the most dramatic, will have the most dramatic impact on reducing the costs to poor people and to all consumers is reduction of prices, period. And when you put a windfall uh, tax, if someone once said that a person far smarter than me, I think it was Milton Friedman, is the power to tax is the power to destroy, okay? And when you tax something, you reduce uh, the ability of that ent entity to produce itself. And that's the biggest problem that we're suffering from today. 
It is the lack of energy supply that is raising these prices. So while it may seem nice in the, in the short term, in the long term, those windfall profit taxes are eventually going to be paid by the consumer. And when they're paid by all consumers across the board, poor people suffer the most from it. It, is, it becomes a de facto regressive tax. Okay.